welcome to Expert Project 2020 at Richmond Montessori School. My name is Bella. I'm a fifth year student in Ms. Callen's upper elementary class. My friends have been working for almost a year now learning about a topic of their choice. Tonight, some of them are going to share highlights of their research with you. I have observed my six year friends and they have been working super hard to get this done and present it to all of you. We are so glad that our six year friends will still get a chance to present. We are all grateful you chose to join us for this special evening. If you are logged into Facebook to watch, please feel free to comment and share our experts along. They are virtually gathered on a meet, watching this presentation together, and would love to see the feedback. Please gather around, grab some snacks and drinks, relax with your family, and enjoy. Our first presenter is Kaya. Hello, my name is Kaya Manier, and today I'll be talking to you about Alcatraz. Alcatraz is the infamous prison that lies in the San Francisco Bay. Alcatraz, or better known as The Rock, continues to allure people to discover the mysteries that the island holds, from the geology of the bay, to the prisoners that called Alcatraz home, to the Great Escape. Today I'll be talking to you about building the prison, the geology of the San Francisco Bay, famous criminals, the life of an inmate at Alcatraz, and the Great Escape. Building Alcatraz. Building Alcatraz was a tough task that took many years to complete. Before Alcatraz opened as a federal penitentiary, it was first used as a lighthouse that opened in 1853. In 1934, Alcatraz Island was handed over to the, to the United Department of Justice. Brigadier Sumner was the manager of construction of Alcatraz. In 1853, Alcatraz only housed 300 men. Brigadier realized that Alcatraz didn't have enough room, and as a result, in 1906, he expanded Alcatraz to fit 600 men. The Geology of the San Francisco Bay. There were multiple tectonic plates that helped create the bay where Alcatraz sits. The North American Plate and the Farallon Plate were the two plates that made the San Francisco Bay. 6,500,000 years ago, the, the Farallon Plate was shoved under the North American Plate. The plate that shifted made the San Andreas Fault System. When the plates moved, the edge of the North American Plate shifted upwards, making Alcatraz the tip of a mountain. If the plates had not moved, the San Francisco Bay would look completely different than it does today. Famous criminal. Alphos Capone was born on January 17, 1899. By 1934, Al Capone was known as the most notorious criminal in the world. At the age of seven, Al Capone became involved in a small-time criminal gang with his older brother. Al's most known crime was the Valentine's Day Massacre. During the massacre, Al Capone was given the nickname Scarface. Al Capone stayed in the cell number D5. On, Janu on January 25th, 1947, Al Capone died, leaving behind a criminal legacy that is known to this day. George Kelly has a mysterious past that has muddled many. George was born on July 18th, 1895, and nothing is known of his parents or his early life. His favorite weapon was the old-fashioned machine gun, and was given the nickname George Machine Gun Kelly base, based on his favorite weapon. On September 26, 1933, George and his wife were arrested for the kidnapping of Charles Urchel. George Kelly died on July 18, 1954, in Alcatraz's prison hospital from a heart attack. Robert Stroud was born on January 28, 1890. His full name is Robert Franklin Stroud. When Robert first shot a man, he turned himself in, and he landed himself in jail at the age of 16. Robert Stroud was known as the Birdman of Alcatraz. He wasn't allowed anything in his cell and wasn't allowed out of his cell because he was incredibly smart and the authorities didn't trust him. Robert spent 11 years in the prison hospital. On November 21st, 1963, Robert Stroud died at the age 73, having spent 54 years in prison. The life of an inmate at Alcatraz. At Alcatraz, the schedule for the inmates was very tight and strict. The inmates would wake up at 7 o'clock a.m. every day and make their beds. Then they would stand at a single file line and wait for breakfast. At 8 o'clock, the inmates would begin to work. Inmates would work six hours a day on a regular schedule. They would attend school every day in shifts between the hours of 2 o'clock p.m. and 6 o'clock p.m., where they would learn basic math and grammar. The inmates would end their day at 9 o'clock, and, and would, the inmates would end their day with a head count and lights out would be at 9 o'clock. The Great Escape. The Great Escape is one of the biggest mysteries in the world. The four inmates that were involved in The Great Escape were Alan Clayton West, the Anglin brothers, and Frank Morris. The escape, the escape started to take shape in December of 1961, and it took a year and a half to complete. Alan West worked in maintenance and was friendly with the guards, so he convinced the guards to let him and his accomplices work on top of a cell house. They secretly worked on top of the cell house, making a raft out of raincoats and dummy heads out of cotton and soap. On the night of the escape, 
the inmates dug holes through their cells that were six by nine inches in diameter. As soon as the guards discovered that the inmates had broken free, the FBI was notified. Even though the inmates successfully escaped, the mystery is whether or not the inmates survived and if they're still alive today. Conclusion. In conclusion, this topic has been so interesting to research over the past 10 months. I'm so thankful for Expert because it has taught me how to be a better writer and how to stay organized. I'd like to thank Ms. Linton, Ms. Kaylin, and Mr. Hamilton for helping me through my entire Expert journey. I'd like to thank my mom and my dad for supporting me throughout this year. I'd like to thank my Aunt Kiki for being my second reader, and I'd like to thank my mentor, Acadia, for helping me become a better writer. These are my image credits, image credits, image credits. Thank you. I will now have time to answer any questions you may have. Joshua. All right, so... Isn't, where was the main way that they thought that they were supposed to escape to? Um, what do you mean? Like, their escape path? Like, because, like, I forgot, like, which was the main way that they were trying to escape? Like, what do they think people were trying to escape towards? They were trying to escape Alcatraz because they didn't want to be there. And they took, they dug holes through and they met in the shaft that led up to the roof where they um, scaled the roof and then they jumped off the building and then they used their raft and made and um, rode all across the San Francisco Bay. But they're, yeah. Mm. Reyna. Um, how did they dig the holes? Like what tools did they use? They used a spoon, but it was like a metal spoon, but it took them a really long time to dig through. They did do it though, but it was it, it was a very small hole that they had to go through. Okay, thank you. Arv. So you said that guy, um, so the inmate asked the guards if you could go to the tower, but so why did the guards trust him? He had been in the prison for a while, and he wasn't like he wasn't necessarily did anything. He hasn't done he hadn't done anything wrong since he'd been there, and so they kind of trusted him. Also, he worked in maintenance, and he told them that he was going to paint the um the cell on top of the cell house, and so they used a tarp to say, "I don't want to get dust down on the bottom of the floor," so they let him do it. But he tricked he tricked them. Oh, okay, but then they weren't guys with him when he did that. No. Okay, was it only him, or was there other inmates too with him doing that? Um, this will be my last question. Um, hold on. So, why was Alcatraz like? Did were they? Why did? My question is, how long was Alcatraz operational? It was operational for. Until from 1954 to, uh, sorry, 1854 till 1960, I think. I think huh. 1961. Okay. So it was open for quite a while. Thank All right. you. All right. Um, next up, we'll have Evan. Hi, my name is Evan, and for my expert topic, I chose anesthesiology. I have been interested in this top in this ever since the third grade, when I fell and broke my arm. It was a colos fracture, and it um, it was knocked out of place, so I had to be put under anesthesia in order for it to be set. If I was awake, it would have hurt a lot. Some things I'll be talking about in this presentation are. What is anesthesia and what are the different types of anesthesia? What was it like having a procedure before anesthesia was noticed? Who is Raimundus Lulis? Who are anesthesiologists and technology and monitoring tools? What is anesthesia and what are the types? 
Anesthesia is a medication that is used during most medical procedures. It puts the patient in either a sleepy or a numb state. There are many different types of anesthesia. General anesthesia puts the patient in a completely unconscious state. Local anesthesia only numbs a small area on the body. Regional anesthesia numbs a limb. Epidural am anesthesia numbs from the waist down. Topical anesthesia is not given by doctors. It is usually in cough drops and is what gives it its numb feeling. Light sedation only numbs very lightly. Deep sedation makes the patient very loopy. Analgesia is a medicine that goes with the anesthesia, which gives the numbness. Laughing gas is used on only children to calm them down before the anesthesia is administered. What was it like having... A a procedure before anesthesia was created. Anesthesia was not always around, so it was very painful having a procedure. Also, people from anywhere could come and watch a procedure happen. This was definitely not comfortable for the patient, and so would refuse to go into surgery, and because of this, there could be major consequences. Another problem that would occur is that the tools would not be clean, and many people would die from infections and mistakes in the procedure. Many people would go insane because of the pain that would happen and would usually commit suicide. Who is Raimundus Lulis? Raimundus Lulis was a famous Spanish philosopher, mathematician, and chemist that invented the main ingredient and in general anesthesia. He lived in Spain from 1232 to 1315. Even though he created it in his lifetime, it was not used until the 1860s. Who are anesthesiologists and what do they do? Anesthesiologists are the doctors that administer the anesthesia to the patient. They also monitor the patient throughout the procedure. They make sure that the patient has the right amount of all the medicines and the right ones too. There is also another type of anesthesiologist called an anesthesiologist assistant. They help the anesthesiologist with all of their work and monitoring the patient. Technology and monitoring tools. Anesthesiologists use many different tools to help monitor the patient. The stethoscope to listen to the heart, the pulse oximeter to measure the amount of oxygen in the blood, the breathing machine to help the patient breathe if they are under the influence of general anesthesia, a blood pressure machine to measure how hard the heart is working, an IV which administers all of the necessary medications, and a gas mask to the patient to administer the laughing gas. Overall, I really enjoyed the experience expert brought me, especially because I want to become an anesthesiologist when I grow up and help the people the way they did to me by helping my arm get set in place and not feeling a thing. Also, if I was given the chance to do expert again, I would do it on the heart as my dad is a cardiologist. These are my image credits. I would like to acknowledge my mom, dad, and brother, grandma, and great aunt, Drs. Robert and Brooke Trainer, Ms. Kaylin, Ms. Linton, and Mr. Hamilton and LJ. Thank you. I will now take any questions you may have. Nolan? Okay, so is... How many, an, does anesthesia, what type of injury do you have to have to go under anesthesia? So, it really depends. So, if you're talking about, like, a major injury, it has to be major if you want to go under general anesthesia. General anesthesia is the most commonly used one outside of local anesthesia, which is used for dentistry but yeah so if you let's say you broke your arm and it was out of place and it was going to be really painful if they were to do it while you were awake so they have to put you under so you don't feel a thing and it just goes on and you just wake up feeling fine okay joshua Um, what type of, do they, is there an anesthesia that they use to just, like, numb you if you're, like, having stitches or something? Um, yes, that is local anesthesia. 
that yeah. one's like basically wherever the stitches would be. It's like when I had stitches in my knee, they would put that in my knee. Yes, before they did the stitches, so you wouldn't really feel the stitches. Thank you. Um, Luke, and then I have time for one more. How many types of dif different anesthesia are there? Um, well, as I mentioned, there are So as you can see here, there's general anesthesia, local anesthesia, regional anesthesia, epidural anesthesia, topical anesthesia, light sedation, deep sedation, and more. The rest, analgesia and laughing gas are just extras. Okay. All right, uh, last one, Brenda. Brenda. So, if anesthesia was created earlier before they used it, why didn't they use it? So, they had always, everyone had always been looking for the perfect drug to make you not feel anything if you were under a major operation. So, they didn't, nobody really knew because like they were just testing a lot of different things they were just testing random things and they just one day bumped into it and said hey this looks really good why don't we try it out and that's just the one in general there are many the main ingredient in other anesthesias is usually propofol so okay um, next up we have Gul. Good evening. My name is Gul Travel and I choose to do my expert project on artificial intelligence. I had a few big questions when I was first diving into my topic. What does artificial intelligence hold for the future? Will these robots replace the need for humans? And what influence does AI have in the world? Tonight I will discuss four main ideas. Evolution of human innovations leading up to artificial intelligence, how AI works, social issues surrounding AI, and the future of AI. Evolution of human innovation. The first stage of innovation was the spark to all the innovations humans have today, and it all started with fire. No one knows how humans first controlled fire, but we know the creative potential of the human brain increased dramatically because of this new discovery. There are all kinds of thoughts humans cannot think without words. Humans can either think in word form or inch form. Scientists classify present day languages into families that were derived from proto languages. Language is definitely a helping hand for humans. Without language, humans would be at a loss to express their thoughts. The Third Age began 5,000 years ago and writing was first developed by the Sumerians, people who lived in the southern part of what we now call Iraq. Writing revolutionized humanity because for the first time, the thoughts a person had could live after him or her. Knowledge could be flawlessly copied and ideas could finally live outside the human mind. Writing in its earliest forms was about keeping legal records, legal codes, and religious texts. Writing slowly developed books, journals, and diaries that people started to take everywhere. How AI works. Coding a machine properly according to its task is one of the most critical parts of machine learning. AI, which can be developed with different coding languages, but the most commonly used language is Python. Other common languages include C++ and Java. Companies use these coding languages to create successful AI products that have changed society. Apple was the first company to use AI in a cell phone. Face ID is one of Apple's most popular and biggest achievements in the field of AI. This company developed software and is considered one of the big four technology companies along with Amazon, Google, and Facebook. Social issues surrounding AI. A widespread misunderstanding is that all AI systems, including advanced robotics and digital robots, will one, will one day will eventually replace humans in one dis industry after another. Researchers believe self-driving vehicles will one day replace taxi, delivery, and truck drivers. Less fortunate people whose jobs have been replaced by AI will struggle with debt and healthcare. However, AI is not replacing the need for humans. It is replacing the need for humans to do tedious grunt work. In fact, humans are needed to develop, train, and manage various AI applications. The future of AI. 
AGI stands for Artificial General Intelligence. AGI is a supercomputer with the capability to learn on its own. Right now, programmers give their computers their goals, like, re like recognizing email spam, but AGI could set that goal for itself. It would be a machine capable of understanding the world as a human. Although AGI doesn't exist yet, some critics believe that it could be a threat to humanity. Once general AI comes into being, it will start taking jobs such as drivers, radiologists, and many more. AI has beat recent headlines with its challenges, risks, failures, and successes. AI has been defined in many ways, but today it is labeled as a techno-scientific branch. It is going to continue to evolve in the near future. All of a sudden, we've lost a lot of control. We can't turn off our internet, we can't turn off our smartphones, we can't turn off our computers. You used to ask a smart person a question. Now who do you ask? It starts with G-O and it's not God. Steve Wozniak. I bet you can guess it's Google. This quote represents one of the main disadvantages of AI. With its creation, the precious knowledge people have spent years studying is available at anyone's fingertips. Concluded. Overall, the expert, project uh, the expert project experience was definitely nothing like those simple reports I did in lower L. This is by far the best part of being in sixth grade for me, and I would do it again in a heartbeat. If I were to go back and do more research, I probably would have focused more on the future of AI and its impact on the world. I would also like to dig more into job loss and human predictions. Acknowledgements. I would like to thank Alexa Linton for proofreading my chapter and giving me advice throughout the whole year. Mr. Hamilton, Mrs. Linton, and Mrs. Kalen for teaching me how to be an expert. Mr. Ford and Mr. Mithra for editing my paper. My interviewees for taking time out of their day to help me with my research. And my, and my peers and fellow experts for being honest about my performance and research. These are my image credits. Thank you for listening. I will now be happy to take any questions you might have. Uh, Joshua? Um, isn't there like some sort of AI that's like in the military to help save people's lives or something? Um, I'm not sure. I didn't research that aspect, so there might be. I don't really know. Um, Abhishek? Um, so that last quote you said about Google, um, do you think that will actually, um, or wait, no, never mind. Um, I mean, when do you think that? AI would take over if it does happen? Um, probably 2050. That's when it's supposed to start peaking at its highest achievement level, I guess. That's what people are predicting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, and please welcome Hassan White. Hello, everyone. My name is Hassan White, and the topic I chose to do my expert project on is the civil rights movement. Some of my biggest questions while doing my research were, how has the civil rights movement impacted society? What are the key events that made up this movement? Uh, how has the perspective of the Caucasian towards African Americans, African Americans changed throughout time? And what made the civil rights movement so important in African American history? Today, I'm going to focus on the following aspects of the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, segregation, the bus boycott, and the march on Washington. Martin Luther King Jr. was a civil rights activist and minister. Martin was known as a hero in the black community and his work focused on equal rights for African Americans. He inspired many people to fight for what they believe in with words and not fists. He has been part of many events that led to the betterment of African Americans, such as the bus boycott and the march on Washington. Martin led the march in Washington and set a bar for success as an African American. His famous I Have a Dream speech is well known around the world as one of the greatest speeches in history. Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks was a civil rights activist and secretary for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP for short. Her work was originally focused on showing on showing rights that the that black people were worth more than they made it seem. However, in doing so, she started a movement. On December 1st, 1955, Rosa took a stand against the segregated buses and started the bus boycott. She was a strong woman with a strong mind and without her, there would be no bus boycott. Segregation. Racial segregation in the United States began in the late 1800s. Once slavery was coming to an end, segregation took its place. Each different in their own ways, segregation separated blacks and whites as if they were in different categories. Jim Crow was a type of segregation, and probably the most well-known. The Jim Crow law stated that anyone with 
colored skin will be forced to settle for less than they deserve. Blacks couldn't drink from the same water fountains, use the same bathrooms, or eat at the same restaurants as whites. The end of the notion of separate not equal was the beginning of desegregation. Wait. Uh, that's not good. Was the beginning of... I can't see them. Was the beginning of desegregation. However, it did not happen overnight. It took a course of years for it to manifest, but eventually it caught on. It started with desegregating the schools and expanded from there. The bus boycott. The bus boycott was a protest against the segregated buses in Montgomery, Alabama. The bus boycott was led by Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. On December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks took a stand against the segregated buses by refusing to give up her seat and started a movement. Shortly after, Rosa was arrested and the black community was outraged, so they began boycotting the buses. Many people used the bus to get around, so they had to find another way to get through their everyday lives. They began riding bikes and walking in groups. The city was losing more and more money every day, and eventually they would have to change the rules. Finally, on June 6, 1956, the Supreme Court ruled against the segregated buses and the rules were no more. The bus boycott was the first civil rights act and the beginning of desegregation. The March on Washington. The March on Washington was a protest against all segregation in the United States. The protest was held in Washington, D.C. because it is the U.S. Capitol and the home of the Lincoln Memorial. Because Abraham Lincoln passed the 13th Amendment, which ruled against slavery. It was led and organized by Martin Luther King Jr. The march was filled with a number of events, such as songs, poems, and speeches. But the most significant, however, was Martin's I Have a Dream speech. In his speech, he stated, I have a dream that little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. I feel it is safe to say that that part of your dream has come true. Conclusion. Overall, being an expert has been an amazing experience, and I had an amazing time learning about my people. If I were to go back and do it again, I would focus on the police brutality aspect of it because that part is still happening today in the United States. I would like to acknowledge my expert teachers, Mr. Hamilton, Ms. Linton, Ms. Garrity, and Mr. Hamilton for guiding me through the process and for my parent and my parents for helping me along the way. These are my image credits. Thank you. In honor of this young man who was a victim who lost his life to racism recently, I decided to include him in my presentation. I will now be taking questions. Abhishek. Um, so were Rosa Parks and um, Martin Luther King uh, Jr., were they friends? Like, did they yes, know? Technically, they were work like because they worked together and they met through the system, but technically they were friends. Okay. So, yes. Thank you. Mm. Nolan? Um, I couldn't. I only saw your Martin Luther King Jr. slide and your very last slide. But I think your presentation was really good. Thank you. Maybe Brenda? It made me see in my mind. How common was lynching back then? And is it still happening today? Well, it it happened very often, sadly. And unfortunately, I'm pretty sure it doesn't happen in the United States anymore. But in other places it might, but not in the United States, no. And Luca. And after him, I have time for one more question. Luca? Uh, yeah? I called on you. Um, yeah, how many speeches did Martin Luther King do? He, he gave two. Two. Okay. Thank you. Abhishek? 
Um, what made you want to research this civil rights act or like the bus boycott and like well, this specific time period other than like other civil rights? Well, time? When, when I was younger, I read this book on Martin Luther King Jr. And it was pretty much like a short summary of his life with pictures. But I wanted to learn more about it. And when I did more research, I found out that he led the March on Washington. And that pretty much ties in with the rest of the the rest of the civil rights movement. Thank you. And that will be my last question. Cool. Does this have a personal connection to you somehow, like your family? What'd you say? Does this have a personal connection to you besides your culture and stuff? Well, it kind of does because technically, I would say it 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 does because my ancestors probably went through most of these things that happened throughout the decades, so yes. Thank you. And next will be Lex Smirna. Hello, my name is Lex Mirno, and my topic for expert project is coding in Python. Fools ignore complexity, pragmatists suffer it. Some can avoid it, geniuses remove it. I chose this quote because coding is one of the most effective ways to remove complexity. In this presentation, I'll be covering the recent history of coding, Guido Van Rossum and the creation of Python, the appeal of Python, and Python today. When you think of coding, what do you think about? Do you think of a bunch of people in their basements sitting in front of a computer effortlessly spinning out code and making whatever they want? Because frankly, that's not true. A fantastic example of this is Mary Allen Wilkes and her Sanvi. Mary Allen Wilkes was one of the first female coders. She was originally going to be a trial lawyer. She became a coder after it was recommended by her teacher. She helped develop the laboratory instrument computer, Link. Link was the very first usable personal computer. After Mary developed Link, she did not get any attention from the community. Instead, the men who built the computer got all of the credit. Later, Mary fulfilled her dream of becoming a trial lawyer. Ruji Sanvi did not intend to become one of the most influential coders. She wanted to work at her father's car factory. She ended up working at Facebook in 2010 and was the first female employee. She developed the newsfeed feature. She later left in 2011 to start Code, which was later bought by Dropbox. Guido Van Rossum was very important in the world of coding. He was born and raised in the Netherlands. He graduated from the University of Amsterdam with a master's degree in math and computer science. His first job after college was at CWI. Python was conceived in the Netherlands by Guido Van Rossum. He thought of making his own coding language while making the coding language ABC for Amoeba, owned by CWI. Although ABC was not as successful as hoped, Guido pursued the idea of making a coding language further, eventually making Python. Guido had a great time working on Python. Sadly, on October 19th, 2019, Guido retired as Python's benevolent dictator for life. He now lives in Silicon Valley, California. Python is approachable because of its easiness to learn and comprehend. When you start programming in Python, either by yourself or following an instruction manual, one of the first things you will be instructed to do is type print hello world, which will cause hello world to appear on the screen. Another reason why Python is approachable is because of its similarities to other coding languages, specifically JavaScript. If a veteran software engineer who is skilled in JavaScript tried to code in Python, it would be especially easy due to their many similarities. Python is easy to learn because of its many guides. One of the most useful in my opinion is Python Pi Game and the Raspberry Pi by Sloan Kelly. Another useful guide is the YouTube channel Coding Train. Adafruit also has plenty of tutorials on how to connect microcontrollers to Python code. Python has simplified the jobs of many software developers and made coding much more accessible. Even though Python was named after the sketch comedy show Monty Python's Flying Circus, it has become more serious than ever before. What had started out as Guido's pet project has evolved into much more. 
It has simplified the jobs of many people and made coding much more accessible. Images cited. Expert was a challenging, rewarding, fun, and difficult experience. From learning about people like Gita Van Rossum and Barry Warsaw and how the world has been majorly changed by coding, my experience with Expert Project will stay with me for the rest of my life. At some times I would say it was stressful and at other times I would describe it was sooth as soothing. This project has affected me and changed the way I view the world. From what started out as my hobby, Python has evolved into part of my life and a tool to help me overcome challenges. The work was hard and difficult, but manageable if you kept up with it. If I were to get the choice to be an expert again, I most definitely would take it. I would like to acknowledge my parents for helping me with expert, Ms. Shanti for encouraging me to do expert and hub even if I didn't want to, Ms. Perrin and Ms. Rao for encouraging me since I came to the school, Bjorn Peterson for mentoring and helping me with expert, and the upper elementary teachers for leading me through expert. I'd also like to acknowledge my interviewee, Barry Warsaw, and the PyCon poster committee for allowing me to present my project at this year's International Python Conference. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Joshua. Um, what was that you, the first YouTube channel you said? Coding Train. Thank you. Arov. What is the difference between um, Python and um, JavaScript? Syntax. Huh? Syntax. Okay. Abishak? Can you explain again why uh, why Python is so easy to so much easier than some other coding languages to learn? So Python is easier to learn because it has become extremely popular, extremely fast, and has had a ton of tutorials made about it. If you mm -hmm. just look up Python in any library, you are most likely to find books about snakes, and then immediately after those books about snakes, tutorials on how to do pretty much anything. Thank you. Do you know how to code in Python? I do. I have time for one more question. All right, next up is Jack Stark. Hello. My name is Jack Stark, and for my extra project, I researched D-Day. Today, I will be covering before D-Day, the battle itself, and the aftermath of it. In 1944, Europe was consumed by war between the Axis powers, led by Germany against the Allied forces. The battle had been raging for almost five years with no end in sight. The powers were the Axis, made up of Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini, and Hideki Tojo, and the Allies were made up of Franklin D. Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin. After four long years of war, the Allies needed a foothold in Europe. Then the idea of D-Day came in. D-Day was a full-scale attack in Normandy, France. The attack was made up of Allied forces, and the objective was to fight the Nazis on their ground and begin the end of the war. After two years of planning, it was D-Day minus one, or the day before D-Day. The Allies found out there was only a one in four chance of survival, but it was delayed one day due to bad weather. One fun fact is, this photo is of Eisenhower talking to the troops before DVD day about fly fishing in the mountains. In the battle, there were 20,000 paratroopers, 800,000 soldiers, and 800 points, not including gliders. There are different beaches for different soldiers. There are only five beaches, and they're named for gold, sword, Juno, Utah, and Omaha. Omaha, or Bloody Omaha, by what the soldiers called it, was the most deadly beach. 
Most troops would drown due to the weight of their gear, platoons would die before the beach, and many would get shot on the boat ramp. We must remember the losses on D-Day, but death was a big reason we won the war, and the death on D-Day was more than overwhelming. During the battle, the comm lines were scrambled. There were many hints that the fight was going well, but truly the fight was already over. Days later, the troops were informed that D-Day had been a success, and days after it had been won. VE Day means Victory in Europe Day. On April 30th, 1945, Hitler committed suicide. And on May 8th, 1945, it was VE Day. VE Day was a day of celebration and honor. I would like to thank Ms. Linton for guiding me through this process and her never-ending support. Ms. Kaylin and Mr. Hamilton for revising my drafts and offering encouragement. Arushi for helping me with my drafts and getting things done quickly so I could move forward. My mom, dad, and sister for being there when I needed them. And my classmates for helping me time to time. Here are my image credits, more image credits. Thank you, I will now be, I will now be taking questions. Um, Abhishek? Um, so I, I had two questions. One, what made you want to research this war rather than any other wars? Well, I felt like this had, um, World War II had a impact on the world. Because it was um, not just Germany, it was also. Um, and also, oh, sorry. And also, why did most platoons die before they even reached the beach? Um, well, they were in Higgins boats, which were manufactured in New Orleans, as just a fun fact. But um, they were open, they didn't have any cover on them. But so. On Omaha Beach, um, it was there was the most artillery fire because um, m much more troops were stationed there, and since there was no cover, um, it was almost like free reign just to shoot, almost. So yeah. Thank you. Um. Brenda? So, did any spies happen to plan D Day? Like, help plan D Day? Um, spies were actually one of the reasons D Day was a success. It was um, that some spies were, were very high ranked in um, Nazi. So, they, so, people and Nazis trusted them and they said that um they kept informing the Nazis that the Allies were going to attack in Calais, France, which is about 20 miles north from Normandy beaches. So yes, I would say that spies were a pretty big reason that DA was a success. Um, Kaya? What does D-Day stand for? Um, D-Day means, it's a bit of a weird name, but D-Day means the day of days, which means it's almost like America's finest hour, really, or finest day. So, yeah, or Operation Overlord, as its code name was. Um, I have time for one more question. 
Joshua. Um, so, uh, I forgot. Okay, um, Ransom. Do you know how many people were killed on D-Day? Um, it's not exact, but it's set the numbers. This is including um Nazi Germany. Um, it overall there are I it's a big range, but it was either eight eight thousand to twelve thousand people died on D Day, and that was and four or five thousand died in the first two hours of D Day. So yeah. Um, thank you, thank you for watching, next is ratings.